Hello, welcome to the attendees of the Outbreaking.io live summit. My name is Jessica Lister, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. The topic of discussion is what does demonstrating EAT look like? And let's dive right into it. First and foremost, if we're talking about expertise, I'll have to give you a little example as to who I am. Uh, I've been working at, as an SEO at agencies for over eight years now. Um, I am well-versed in on-page technical and content and actually have a background in digital PR and journalism as well. Um, where my specialties lie are with data studio report builds, which I love, um, supporting clients and managing WordPress. Uh, I especially enjoy working on technical migrations, the platform migrations, CMS, uh, domain changes and site builds. Um, and content, naturally, is kind of where I found my home. So very excited to dig, to dig into something that is primarily seen as a facet of the overall content strategy and content conversations within the SEO and web sphere, but truly is something that extends far beyond just long form content and blog posts um, and really demonstrates what Google is looking for when it talks about quality as a whole. So what we're gonna be talking about in this session uh, is we're just going to dive really deep into some examples of what it really looks like when you're demonstrating expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness on your website, uh, be it on specific landing pages or across the site as a whole. And then we're gonna end with discussion, uh, a discussion about the role of EAT within your SEO campaign. Just as a quick refresh for anybody who's here who does not know what EAT is or just needs a reminder, uh, EAT is a facet of Google's search quality evaluator guidelines. And so it's something that gets utilized internally um, by members who help to, to build and provide feedback that powers their algorithm. This means that it's not actually a ranking factor um, and it's not necessarily a confirmed part of the algorithm. What instead it does is it helps us to understand how Google perceives quality across the web. And so it gives us little clues as to where we should be focusing our attention on um, when we're thinking about building a quality authoritative site and a presence online. It also helps us to clarify different standards between the industries uh, and user intent as well. So when you talk about EAT, you'll often hear that used in tandem with YMYL or your money, your life. Um, and that is used to signify websites that are held to a higher standard uh, due to the nature of the content, which is typically uh, in the fields of like medical research, um, law, um, anywhere where you would be spending money uh, and potentially putting your life into the hands of, of another uh, for relying on the content that's being expressed on their website. So let's dive right into it. When we talk about expertise, I like to think of this as who are you to be talking about this particular topic? We know when it comes to, for example, content strategies, that there is a litany of questions out there that users want answers to. And because we operate within a specific field or within a specific niche, we feel inclined to provide answers and solutions to those questions. But how does Google go about understanding who is qualified to be talking about those things and who maybe isn't. Something that is really important to keep in mind is what Google says about who can be an expert within each field. This quote here uh, states very high quality main content can be created by experts, hobbyists, or even people with everyday expertise. We see this for sure within uh, the world of baking and cooking where you don't have to be a personal chef or professional chef or own a restaurant to have uh, a website where you're providing recipes that thousands and maybe millions of people are following. Um, same thing with any type of hobby, you name it, there are going to be people who are really enthusiastic about that topic and very well educated on that topic, even if that's self-education. So here's a few ways that we can show expertise online. We can show it by talking about the degrees that we hold within higher education that might be relevant to uh, the topic at hand. 
we can share our awards, nominations, and different industry recognition. We can talk about certifications and accreditations because higher education, of course, is not the path for everyone. And even if you have a degree in higher education, it may not be as relevant to the field that you're working in and speaking to online. And above all else, it's going to be talking about contributions to the industry publications and to the overall conversation that's happening within that specific field. So how active are you in those discussions? Do people know you? Do they, are they able to kind of look and see uh, breadcrumbs of where you've been discussing this topic uh, online in a way that is meaningful, that is accurate, uh, and that is looked to by other peers within the industry? So let's dig into some examples. Degrees in higher education. We're actually gonna kill two birds with one stone with this example from L, which is everything you've ever wanted to know about microneedling. Microneedling, uh, kind of an intense topic. Uh, you're, you're physically doing things to your skin. Anyone who's a reader of L uh, might trust them for beauty recommendations, but when it comes to skincare, this is a little more involved. And so rather than um, doing research and then providing the answers that touting them themselves. Uh, the folks at L have actually turned to a dermatologist uh, with a PhD who has published extensive research on microneedling. So there she has that uh, those breadcrumbs within the online conversation. And then you have a clinical professor and dermatologist at Yale. And they're the ones who are providing all of the data within this piece of content uh, that helps users to uh, be able to trust it because the information that Elle is providing is backed by experts. Certifications and accreditation is an easy one. Um, and especially if you um, create a lot of content online, or even if you don't, um, you know, having a place where it's clear who all are the folks behind the website, behind your web presence, and what are their certifications and accreditations like. So for a real estate company like Smith Group, where they might not have a lot of content, um, but you wanna be able to trust them as a firm to potentially work with. You know, they list out bios for all of the leaders within their space and uh, on the sideline for all of their professionals, they include the different credentials that they have as well as where they specialize and their education. There are many ways and forms that expertise can come into play. Um, that can be something that is provided to you, not only from the services that you are offering or the products that you're creating, so something that's customer facing, but it can also be how your business is run, uh, looking internally. For example, are you one of the best places to work? Is your business one of the faster growing? Um, you know, what other, what other values can you provide from just operating as an entity um, that you can get uh, an award for because there are many ways to get rewards online uh, and many of them uh, fortunately or unfortunately are pay to play. You can be a Michelin star restaurant uh, or recognized on a global scale, but on the same hand, expertise can also mean that you received awards and nominations on a local scale as well. A lot of these local entities will also be magazines uh, and online publications. Oops, but an example of World Finance, uh, you have uh, a global publication. Another way to demonstrate expertise, we talked about contributions to industry publications and conversation. This is pretty common one if you are building out kind of a robust online strategy, especially if it's um, with SEO at the forefront, you'll be looking to, for example, copywriters or ghostwriters to be creating content for you. Um, and one of the key ways that you can build expertise is by having somebody who is relevant within, the, within your field uh, be the face of your brand online. And so this is the case with the Green Pal where he mentioned specifically areas that he's been featured um, that are local to his business, or maybe not local, Indianapolis and, and Sacramento, not same. Um, but he's been published a lot of places online. And so when you think about, you know, what expertise does he have in this area uh, of lawn care, well, he's been, you know, sharing his his contributions and his his business acumen all over the web, and so Google again is able to kind of 
link these areas together and understand the expertise that Jane provides. Now, when we're not looking at uh, an individual in particular, sometimes we'll be looking at a brand as a whole. Um, this is the case for a lot of bigger businesses online um, who may not be as willing to share who their writers are, um, especially if they are going through third parties. And so ways that you can show your expertise as a digital brand um, have a lot of similarities, but other, some other things to keep in mind are the accuracy of your content. And that involves both new and old content. If you have uh, older content that's been published, um, you'll likely go through and keep updating it uh, on a recurring basis. And this is especially true if it is something related to uh, your money or life, where it's a more serious topic. Uh, a good example of this might be uh, recalls of products or safety and security issues. Um, you can also join the discussion um, or provide access detail within a niche topic. So what I mean by that is um, if you have a number of subject matter experts within your house, being able to utilize them um, to interject uh, unique points of view and really deep value within the pieces of content you're providing, whether that is an actual quote um, from somebody who wants to be mentioned or just additional information that other researchers online might not have been able to research this on their own. Um, all of that is gonna come up as value that'll really demonstrate like we know more than the average person talking about X, Y, and Z online. Alignment with medical, scientific, or historical consensus uh, is something that is key, um, especially again, when looking at your money or life categories. And this is something in particular that has really hit a number of websites uh, within the year 2020, when you're looking at uh, things like alternative medicine, um, things that are a little more woo, like astrology, crystals, and, and things of that nature. Um, it's important uh, for Google that we're kind of, again, just aligning with general consensus and using uh, evidence-based statements within the content that's being displayed. And then lastly, making sure that there's a satisfying amount of content or products. I think satisfying is a key word to think about, especially when we're looking at you know, what's the best length for uh, a piece of content online? It's whatever satisfies that search for intent. There's no magic number. Um, and that not only goes for blog content, but that actually goes for products as well. And so here's a great example of that for products. We're looking at selling vintage engagement rings online. We have a site with a really nice curated selection, but there's 13 rings. And if you're going to go engagement ring shopping, you probably want to look at more than 13 pieces. And as a result, this page is hanging out on uh, position 53, page five in the search results, versus uh, Lang is the site that's coming up in position number one, and they have over or just about 500 products on their website. Next, we're going to go to authoritativeness. So, who is looking to you to talk about whatever your niche or topic is online? The quote I pulled here is, when a high level of authoritativeness or expertise is needed, the reputation of a website should be judged on what expert opinions have to say. Authority is really, uh, in a way, a lot about reputation online. And there are some things that you can control and there are some things that you can't. What you can control uh, and ways to demonstrate your authority online, first and foremost, starts with your content strategy. Uh, again, going back to uh, the point I made earlier with you know, how in-depth can you get with your content? You know, knowing that you have subject matter experts uh, in-house or at your disposal, you know, your content should be able to go above and beyond websites like you know, a WikiHow or something that is much more generalized that are looking to you to be the authority of that subject. Your About Us page, that's actually a great way for you to demonstrate authority. Uh, and that page is often kind of seen as a toss away, but that page can really be utilized to talk a lot about who you are. It can be used to demonstrate your expertise. Uh, for example, uh, if you have uh, a gym of personal trainers, you know maybe you're not listing out uh, every one of your trainers within the space, but as a whole, you have a standard for the people that you hire to that position, and they all have to have, uh, you know, for example, uh, have studied internal sports and medicine. Um, or they have to pass a certain certification. You know, 
that type of information, even if it's just holistic and talking about your, your overall group or your overall standards for the business can live in your About Us page. News and press mentions often get slept on um, and there's no good reason why. I think most websites, even if you don't have a lot of, of press and you may not have a PR arm that is you know, actively going out um, and kind of generating buzz for your business, uh, you should have an area where you're talking about different news uh, and mentions of yourself in the press. Um, so anywhere that you have been mentioned online makes sense for you to also want to publicize that and share, hey, did you know we were talked about online? Um, really just helps to kind of strengthen that signal, uh, both for Google as well as for uh, the visitors for your site, especially if they're new. And then last but not least is customer reviews and testimonials. I could really thread this throughout, uh, especially with authority and trustworthiness, and it'll come into play there as well. Um, but customer reviews are a great way to demonstrate your authority on your website. And we're here, sure, uh, the, the number of reviews is, is certainly a factor, but it's not the only factor. Um, and I would go so far as to say uniqueness of those reviews, uh, the freshness of those reviews, um, and the velocity and certainly you don't want to try and get the system when it comes to reviews you want to make sure that they are uh, coming by honestly on the flip side here there are a lot of pieces of authority that are kind of less uh less within our control um but certainly something to keep in mind and a lot of these when we think about like backlinks for example as being the number one um you know, the thing that impacts SEO performance. Well, the quality of your backlinks um, and, and the number of them is certainly a signal of authority, but it's by no means the only signal of authority. User engagement. This is actually something uh, coming directly from Google's quality rater guidelines where it's stating that, you know, your money or life websites obviously being held to a higher standard. But when you have sites that um, are a little more a little less formal, so for example, uh, a gossip website, uh, like celebrity gossip, or um, a, like a satirical site, like the, maybe not the onion, but you know, a, a lesser known satirical website, um, user engagement can actually be used uh, to kind of understand the authority there and to understand um, the reputation of that site online. And so understanding like how popular is that site what is the user engagement like? Are users finding the content there helpful? Um, is the site known for providing them with the with the research, uh, with the responses that they need? Offsite reviews, another signal of authority. And this could really be said, I think, for on-site as well. But in particular, um, if we look at um, reviews, say, of specific products, of specific services, if we're looking at you know, best of lists or uh, sites that are, are comparing one business to another, all of those are different signals of authority where Google is helping to understand like, oh, okay, they are actually a player within this space and they are um, kind of understanding the business or the brand and its products to be aligned with the competitors in that space, helps them to better understand what it is that you're offering um, and again, what your reputation is uh, amongst competitors online. And the last thing we have here is your reputation within that topic or niche. Talked about this a little bit, but you know, in particular, does Google understand that you are a satirical website? Does it understand that uh, you are here to serve only cute pictures of dogs and uh, in order to brighten someone's day, but not necessarily to provide um, you know, significant uh, life advice. Um, again, all of these kind of signals that come from other websites that are not so easy to manage, um, but good things to keep in mind when it comes to understanding how your business is perceived online, um, because a lot of these things can actually start from your website um, and, and what you decide to say about your business and where you kind of align yourself within the industry. A few ways to demonstrate authority here. Um, having solid references from the web. Wikipedia is obviously a main place where Google finds a lot of its data, uh, especially when we think about the entities, whether that is your business as an entity, your content creators as an entity online. And so 
Wikipedia is obviously the clear place, uh, but certainly not the only place that can be referencing uh, your website as authoritative. Proprietary data is a fantastic way to demonstrate authority, albeit uh, certainly not the quickest and easiest. Um, so if you are able to share your own surveys, share your own case studies, share your own white papers, um, anything that is generated uniquely um, by your site, especially if it's shareable, if it's something that you can promote and potentially have other sites linked back to, you know, that's a clear way to demonstrate authority on the web. Your popularity. As I teased a little before, um, looking at things like your engagement online, how many social profiles are you active on and what is that feedback and engagement like? What's the sentiment like? You know, Google is able to kind of crawl and understand each of those pieces. And even though you know, we don't really have consensus over whether or not they play into your ranking factors, they can certainly play into Google's understanding of how authoritative your brand is online. And then this goes a little hand in hand with proprietary data, but certainly um, is not only limited to, to that. So having a unique point of view on whatever the piece of content is online can be super important. One of the best examples that I found from the quality rater guidelines is, uh, was a piece on uh, cancer patients and kind of how long they lived uh, after they were diagnosed. And rather than having a medical professional uh, who might've been on staff or might've been somebody that they could reach out to and, and get quotes from, uh, the website actually took a different route and answered that question by interviewing people whose loved ones had passed away. And it was uh, a very, fresh, unique take on answering that question. Um, it wasn't looking necessarily for accuracy. It was supposed to be a very heartfelt human story. And because that content is unique, because it was high quality, um, it wasn't making any, any claims. It wasn't being misleading in any way, um, but it was just providing you know, evidence based on these people's stories. Uh, Google considered that content to be high quality. Last but not least, we dig into trustworthiness. Um, the way I think of this is what is your track record for delivering on X, Y, and Z? Whether that is delivering on quality products, delivering on quality service, delivering on quality content, could be all of the above. One of the quotes I quoted from here is search engine or search results should help people. That is their function. Uh, search results should provide authoritative and trustworthy information not lead people astray with misleading content. They should allow people to find what they're looking for, not surprise people. When someone clicks on your site from the search engine results, they're doing so because they want to satisfy whatever their need is, and they trust that Google has found a site for them that is going to do that. You want to continue to bank on that trustworthiness um, by acting in good faith for the visitors that come to your site. So there are a few ways that you can do that. Um, I've pulled out four of them as examples here. First and foremost, just closing your advertisements, being very clear what is an ad and what is your content. Um, certainly we've all seen spammy sites that have either um, poor user experience or they have uh, sort of a spammy and misleading uh, approach to the way that ads are being served. So the more upfront you are and honest about the types of um, paid advertisements and relationships that you have, the better for your users. The other one is publicizing your qualifications. So there are plenty of sites and businesses out there that have a number of qualifications, um, even as generic as uh, having the BBB accredited business you know, rating set up online. How many of them actually utilize those badges on their website and promote them? Not nearly as many that have them. And so um, whether you are uh, you know, the accredited business, taking B, whether you have one of the certifications um, that we talked about earlier, um, or maybe you are a, a woman-owned business, or uh, you've, you've earned some other type of uh, an accreditation, be it local or national, having those, you know, within the footer of the website, on your homepage, on your About Us page, uh, this in particular, I think was a blog post, uh, that was written by uh, this chimney services company. But either way, making sure that those uh, those things are really clear, especially if users are going to be buying from you um, or spending money with you. Having those upfront can be really helpful. 
updating your content for accuracy, um, of course, is something where you're going to be um, kind of building a lot of goodwill and trust between yourself and your audiences. So if you have a site, uh, especially one that users are likely to come back to, um, that you're getting new users to, older content that's published, making sure that you are keeping them up to date um, with really important topics that are going to, again, affect their money or their lives. Um, and so here's an example of paratology, updating uh, a piece that talks about Instagram's controls. Uh, especially if you're in the tech area, if you're in the health area, there's a lot um, to dispel or there's a lot of new information and new data that comes out every year um, that you should work on having a, a process in play to go back and review that content and make sure that you're providing users with the most accurate and helpful content as possible. And lastly here, referencing citations. Um, we all you know, have some idea of uh, uh, like common sense knowledge that we're able to pull when it comes to writing blog posts. Um, and we all have our favorite kind of sources and places to go. But, you know, one of the easiest ways to build trustworthiness um, and also to create a, uh, a solid high quality network uh, of your website amidst other websites online is by including links to those high quality sources and those other authorities within your space that you want Google to understand you as being uh, kind of within the same uh, network as. And so referencing your citations, making sure that you are not only including sources to your copy, but also linking out to those places is another way of building trust, uh, helping users to understand you know, where you got the data that you're including, where you got, where you got the the statements and claims that you're showing or where that information is provided from. Um, if you are, for example, doing your own study or doing your own recaps of pieces, it's one thing to mention it. It's another thing to be linking back to it. And we definitely choose the latter. All right, for our last few notes here, let's just talk a little bit about the role of EAT in your SEO campaign um, to kind of bring all of that home. Um, so you can think about it more holistically and bringing it into something that is actionable. There are two different ways of it to think about uh, each of these recommendations and, and each of those different examples of ways that we can approach building on our expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. So the first is going to be where it's located because EAT comes into play both at the page by, by page level and at a site-wide level. And so there are plenty of opportunities where you can look at a specific page that may not be ranking as highly um, or may have uh, started declining in performance based on more recent algorithm updates. And so we can look at that particular page and see you know, which pieces uh, is it sort of missing or could be improved upon. Um, and that could be any type of page, whether it's your category page or your PLP, whichever you like to call it. Uh, could be a specific product description page that, that clearly needs more detail, maybe needs some more uh, user reviews. It might be a services page or an industry service type page. Could be your about us, which you talked about. Could also be your contact us, uh, which those pages are often also neglected, usually only include uh, you know, a form or a phone number and an email address and not much else. We could be looking, of course, at individual blog posts and seeing, you know, is the content here of the highest quality? Is it, um, is it going to be satisfying the user's needs well enough? Or are there other pieces of content out there that are doing more and doing it better? We'll look obviously at, at particular news articles kind of come into play with that. Um, and also digital tools that you have online where the main content is that tool. And so, you know, what is the supporting content like? What are the ads like in tandem with that main content? Um, and is it really providing the most value? What I'd recommend is looking at uh, your EAT at that page level uh, to kind of get things going, especially if you're working with clients uh, or you're working with a number of different teams departments who have to work together to uh, implement those changes. But what, is really going to move the needle when it comes to performance online is if you are looking at what changes can be made site-wide. And so not just particular categories, but 
looking at the overall template that gets used on your PLPs, on your product description pages, on your lead gen pages. You know, do you have all of the relevant content that's there? Do you have all the relevant uh, external links that are needed? Um, you know, if we think about um, your team bios or your author templates, first off, do you even have them? Do you have um, mention of anyone who's on your staff on the website? And if so, how much content is there? Um, how relevant is it to showcasing your business and the people who run it as experts within your field? With the author template, same thing applies. You know, do you even have authored pages? If so, are your author pages actually being connected and utilized within your blog? And you know, are you providing all the detail about those people? Um, your NAP, so your name, address, and phone number, does it live just in your content desk page? Because it should be way more, uh, way more frequently used on your website. Uh, perhaps in the footer makes sense. Maybe on the home page makes sense. Um, you know, are you including ways that people can get into contact with you um, through support? in your help sections and in your FAQs? Are you including it uh, as a call to action at the end of your long form content? And if not, are there opportunities to do that? Of course, looking at your long form content and making sure that these optimizations are done on a larger scale than just at the page level is important. And then same thing goes with your tools and resources. The last way that we'll look at this is uh, comparing your main content to the content creator. Um, this is really the way that, that Google kind of describes um, EAT within its guidelines is are we looking, we're looking at the expertise, the authoritativeness, and the trustworthiness of the main content. And we're looking at all of those factors when it comes to the actual content creator as well. And so making sure that we are looking at both of those pieces, right? The, the website or the web page and the person who is, who is responsible for it, whether that is an individual contributor or whether that is the brand as a whole. And so with that main content, let's make sure that it's accurate. Of course, make sure that it's helpful. That's that's the most important thing above all. Um, you know, again, not so much looking at like a word count, but does it have the right length to satisfy what that social need is? And does it have the right level of depth? Um, I'll, I'll pair with that the reading level of that piece of content. You know, does it is it something that can be easily understood by um, your, your correct audience? Um, is it something that is written in such a way that it is useful for those people? Um, how are you using the sources that you have at your disposal? Again, are you including them as, as citations online? Um, who is authoring that main content? And is that clear from wherever the user is on the site, you know, at any point uh, when they're on your page, they should be able to see who is this business um, and how can I get in contact with them or how can I learn more? And then engagement and popularity, again, just thinking about, um, you know, is the content that, that users are engaging with, is it useful? Are you looking at the user behavior metrics for those pieces of content and making sure that the user's needs are being satisfied. Um, and is that content being shared, whether that's socially, whether it's through backlinks, uh, email, or another method. When we look at the content creator, um, last but not least, again, we're going to be looking at what is their education or their certification like to be able to talk about this thing. What is the prevalence of the work that they've done? You know, have they published a lot within the space? Have they been working in that field long? Um, what is their general reputation like? What is the online sentiment when it comes to that particular person? Are they someone who is known within the, within the field or are they kind of a newcomer? Um, hopefully they're not just a, an SEO or a copywriter uh, who really shouldn't be attached to the project. Um, what is their digital network like? So again, where all have they been published and do they talk about a little bit of everything? Are they sort of a jack of all trades or have they been doing this one thing for a decade? And they are the person to ask about X, Y, and Z. Um, and then what is their published work like? What, you know, where have they been published, uh, be it online or in magazines? And, you know, are they a person who you would look to, who you would trust uh, to be an authority or who you would uh, consider to be an expert within that field? 
that's all that I have for you today. Thank you very much if you've listened all the way through. Uh, glad to answer any questions that you have and please feel free to connect with me. My email address and my Twitter handle are on the slide. Cheers.